focus. I think we've all heard the whole thing, like seven streams of income, every millionaire, whoever, whatever. People have a lot of money. They always have seven streams of income. But like, I heard something from Alex Ramosi, who he's becoming more well-known. And he goes, it's extremely egotistical to think that you could do multiple things as well as somebody who's doing one thing. And that really hit me like a brick. Like all I'm working on is replies just right now. And sometimes I have this conversation with my co-founder and other people. It's like, I, I'm not that bright, right? So I can't go juggle multiple things. Plus trying to juggle multiple things stresses me out. Um, there's just so much power in it from so many different angles and focusing on one thing. And that even comes down to not just like, sure, you only have one business, but then also keep in mind that that focus needs to apply in all areas of your life as well. Like for example, I was, I was working until 2.30 in the morning last night. Right. And I'm an established entrepreneur. It's not like I'm just completely new to the ballgame. I have a lot to learn. I'm not saying that with like, take that with a grain of salt. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Journey. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups in the seven and eight figure businesses as well as the founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patent and trademark. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Now, today we've got another great guest on the podcast, uh, Andrew McCullough. And uh, Andrew started his journey, uh, went to uh, community college and uh, played football, uh, got injured, and so uh, was, I didn't uh, end up keeping or keep playing and uh, end up uh, getting uh, going in and uh, getting a, an a internship in accounting and taxes and realized that wasn't for him. Um, so got into financial services instead and found that he liked entrepreneurship, um, became a licensed financial advisor, uh, met a Chinese student for a tutoring business to teach English, um, found out that was a flawed business model. Uh, or focus on that a bit, and then uh, ended or that ended during COVID. During COVID, uh, started a business uh, teaching, coaching people in entrepreneurship, um, and uh, did this for a period of time, and then made the hard decision that uh, that was uh, or too much money associated with it. So uh, found a software or founded a uh, or software for lead generation. Got into that more and started a, a service based business that's evolved to uh, a lead generation software slash platform. So. With that much as a introduction, welcome on the podcast, Austin. Thank you very much. I'm excited for the show today. I was going to say something about the Andrew, but it's okay. Easy, easy mistake. <laughs> oh, if I said uh, Andrew, I certainly meant to say Austin. But uh, all good, all good. So, uh, so now diving into the uh, the topics at uh, at hand. So I took a much longer journey and uh, condensed it into the thirty or forty five uh, second version of it. Um, mm -hmm. But why don't uh, we go ahead and uh, dive into that a bit more? So. Let's rewind and un or, or unpack a bit and tell us a little bit about how your journey got started uh, going off to community college and uh, playing a bit of football. Mm -hmm. um, oh, so we're actually going a step further. So it, it's actually funny um, uh, being a guest on this podcast because a lot of people get into entrepreneurship because they think that they just want to go make a ton of money and like that's what they want to be right from the start. And so I didn't grow up wanting to be an entrepreneur. Um, it, the the ironic part about you mentioning the football aspect is my entire youth, I was just focused on sports 24-7. Um, for example, obviously, uh, I played a lot of sports in college and or not in college. I played a lot of sports in high school, which then that led to me playing football in college. Um, the reason why I bring up the college experience with playing football, though, is because I didn't get a scholarship to go play there. That was actually something that I pride myself on a lot was earning the scholarship because in stature, I'm not a big guy. And um, it sounded like I was some highly recruited uh, prospect out of out of high school. And so it just shows a lot of characteristics that align well with entrepreneurship. Um, and so that's something why whenever I tell my story, I talk about playing in college is because uh, as far as I knew, I wanted to go play at a division one double a, um, and obviously use that to prepare my career going forward. But it's not like I was hoping to get into entrepreneurship now here seven years later and be running my own business and living in a completely different city, you know, life turns out randomly. Um, but yeah, I bet if you have any questions with that in particular, just let me know. No. So, uh, so you got into uh, community college, you were playing football. Now, I think at one point, um, you got injured, so you didn't uh, continue playing, but you also uh, kind of uh, on the academic side focused on accounting and um, did an internship and realized you didn't like the taxes or accounting as much. Is that about right? 
Yeah, if there was one recurring theme, I was just lost. Uh, I tore my ACL for a second time when I was at Iowa Central Community College. And at that point, I, I'd heard people talk about going to school for business, but like, I literally did not know the difference between equity and debt. So for anybody who's in finance, if you want to get into finance, it's about as basic as it gets. But I just, I, I didn't know. I didn't have my parents talking about that when growing up. So after I tore my ACL, um, I was doing a tax accounting internship and I was just trying to piece as much information together as possible. That's how I stumbled into the financial services industry. And um, I, 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 I wish I could say there was one specific point that really made me click to get more career focused. But I think it was just, I was always a very driven person, but all that energy was going towards sports. So when I tore my ACL for the second time and decided I was done playing football, I took all that focus and energy and I just put it towards actually developing in my career. So although I was not not a good student, didn't study well, um, so I wasn't honestly that smart, I had a desire to learn a lot. And so just day by day, I was just trying to consume as much information as possible. Like I was going to investopedia.com and just trying to read articles on finance. And obviously my career took a completely different path, but it gave me a good foundation. No, it makes uh, sense. So you, uh, so you got into that and you said, okay, this may not be the the path for me, but uh, I, you know, you got that experience and, you know, sometimes the best way that you learn that that's not the path for you is you, you try it out and you, you test it out and find, okay, I'm going to go a different direction. So, so now you, you got in, you did that for a period of time, did the internship, um, and then you ended up uh, got, kind of getting into financial services and also finding that you like uh, entre entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, is there any particular topic within that you that you want me to address that you think would be helpful to hear yeah walk or walks you a little bit of uh, how you how you figure that out or, or how you got on that path yep so after i'll actually connect the dots here played football up until uh december of i believe 2016 at iowa central community college and then for the next half year i actually was not enrolled at the university of iowa so for half that year was when i was doing the tax accounting internship as well as i got started as um, i wasn't a financial advisor yet but that's when i got started in financial services so i was doing the accounting internship and i was a financial professional hmm. then comes the fall of what would that be 2016 2017 say like close enough that was when I enrolled at the University of Iowa. I wanted to pursue a finance degree for, to potentially get into investment banking because I started to see more of the uh, investment world. But I was on a trip actually to Chicago where I live now. And that was when I ran into the Chinese student from the University of Iowa. Long story short, we exchanged some contact information and we met at a diner a few days later. And he pitched me on this idea to, to teach English to Chinese children. So it was actually his idea for, for the jump. But then that ended up becoming my main focus for the next couple of years. So that was business super corn tutoring. I hate the name, but hey, I can't go back and change it. Anyways, uh, that business was something that I tried running for about two and a half years. It wasn't very profitable at all. Um, it was a very flawed business model and we could get into that why. But I ran that until graduating in 2019. And then a few months later was when I started to transition into Awesome Color Advisor. And then we could guide forward from there as well. So if you want me to touch on that I can as well. Yep, go ahead or keep on with the journey. Uh, so this is something that I think a lot of newer entrepreneurs should pay attention to that I wish I would have just one of the many learnings is we were, we were recruiting English tutors from United States colleges, particularly those in Iowa, because that's where we were uh, located with clear English, no accent. Um, we were able to speak clear English to teach Chinese or teach English to the Chinese children. And we had a partner company that was finding the Chinese children. So they were really, the partner company was really our customer because that's who was paying us. They wanted tutors who were more experienced in tutor ring. So we had intelligent tutors, but that wasn't necessarily, they didn't all have their degrees already. So they're still in preparation. Um, they wanted higher quality tutors in short, but they weren't willing to compensate us for us more. That could have come down to negotiation, but the people at the level that we were working with didn't have the negotiation power. And so they kept wanting more out of us, but we couldn't provide more. That led to our tutors not performing at the level they expected. So it was very conflicting. So if I were to redo it again, I probably would have found a uh, connection over in China where we would have had somebody find our own tutors. So we could have been sending the pricing model, talking with the parents of the children instead. Um, but I don't regret the experience. I just wouldn't want to go over and do it again. <laughs> no, makes uh, makes sense. So you, so you go down that path and say, okay, maybe the business model doesn't quite work. And I also think if I remember right, when we talked a little bit, um, COVID came along and kind of as uh, COVID was hitting, you decided that maybe it was a good time to 
to end that business or to, to explore something else. So walk through a little bit as you kind of came to that realization where you went to next or kind of what, what that uh, next step in the journey was. Yeah, that was a really tough transition because it was right during COVID. So I had a lot of time to myself. I was very isolated like everybody was. But it was even tougher because I didn't want to be seen like a failure by stopping that business. Like even if you were to rewind the tape, what was that, four years ago? I doubt at the time I would have admitted that we were stopping the business because it was failing. But that was just the fact of the matter. Um, but as I started to get more entrepreneurial from the time I was like 19, 20, 21, um, I saw that people didn't have to just go a corporate route for work, which there's nothing wrong with that. But a lot of people don't want to go work a nine to five. A lot of people don't like when another person can tell them what to do and when. And um, I, I wanted to be able to help people not pursue a route that's not best for them just because they think it's what they have to do. And so that's how I started Awesome McCullough Advising for the coaching. I just figured, you know, there's a lot that I don't know in the world, but um, there are a lot of people who just, they don't see the world the way that I do. They don't have, they don't have infinite possibilities, even like, there's no reason why I should have been getting an entrepreneurship, but Hey, you do it. And that's how a lot of entrepreneurs do it. They just like, I like your hat, by the way. Um, so anyways, with that started Austin McCall advising mainly to do like mindset coaching, all that I would never go back and do it now, but starting that, um, it gave me a better taste for entrepreneurship in terms of the fuller business model. So rather than just recruiting for a company, I was having to obviously handle our finances and everything. And it was very small scale, but it was, it was mainly at the core. It was actually training me to be a better entrepreneur because it was making me very accountable to myself. Like there was a point where all of our clients, I was, I was texting on a daily basis, one accountability item, like Sundays too. So Monday through Sunday, every single day, I had this list, I had this checklist and I would follow up with, I won't say names, but I had to follow up with people on something that they were doing and it was very draining. And I have like call trauma by now that I hate jumping on phone calls unless I absolutely need to be on them because I was on so many calls that that's all I was doing all day, every day. I was on Zoom calls or phone calls all the time. Um, and so it wasn't a, a good business model, but that's what got me into Awesome McCall Advising, going from a coaching business to a marketing agency. And then obviously we went on to sell. So I was able to find some good traction and I can walk through that if, if you want me to. Yeah, absolutely. Keep uh, or keep on uh, sharing. Love to hear the journey. Sure. So what was the, probably the first point of clarity was I was trying to find my own clients for Awesome McCall Advising. I was trying to find coaching clients. And long story short, I came across a lead generation software, um, which would get me, it would automate my LinkedIn outreach. So invites and messages sent, which what it was really doing is just starting a lot of conversations for me to talk to ideal prospects. Um, when going through that process of signing up with the software, I was thinking, who should I reach out to? And I'd heard over the years about having a niche, 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 however you want to say it. And I always overlooked it. I was like, you know, that's not a big deal. Then it's a smaller market. That's not a good idea. But, and I'll, I'll get into this later. I picked uh, working with anybody within financial services because of my financial services experience. Like it's a lot easier to serve a customer or a user when you actually understand their problems from firsthand experience. So that's what we did. And I was doing all this outreach on LinkedIn having conversations. I was getting a lot of meetings booked, but I wasn't closing many clients because people didn't want what I was selling. People didn't want the coaching. Like a lot of these financial representatives are like, well, I already have a manager. I already have an upline. You know, why would I pay for coaching when I already have a leader who can help me with it? Some of them are valid points somewhere, but that's besides the point. But what I saw was really easy to sell to them was the lead generation that I was using. Mm -hmm. So there, there, this could be a long story in and of itself. But I stopped trying to sell them what I thought they wanted and what I thought they needed. And I gave them what they wanted instead. That started to give us a lot of traction as well as it helped us hone in on our marketing message when doing the outreach. And that is what got the business to the point where we had stable recurring income. Or should I say revenue? Because it's different. But it, and then the business started steadily growing as well as we were getting referrals, as well as we were building a better rapport with our clients because we were giving them what they wanted and we we're actually aligned um, in terms of, of where to get them. Like it was, it was an actual business rather than an entrepreneur just wanting to push his own agenda. So now you got it. So it sounds like almost not putting words in your mouth, but, uh, putting words in your mouth that you can uh, certainly correct is, um, so, you know, you kind of had the, it almost sounds like the, the clientele or the people you're working with or the clients were saying, Hey, 
don't really necessarily love the, the business or don't have, they're willing to pay or don't need what you're selling, but we do want, or I do like uh, uh, some of the other stuff you're doing over here and we'd love to do it. Is that kind of what it sounds like if all their kind of shifted the business to where it's at to today, more out of listening to customers and, and looking at uh, market demand? Yeah, that it's, uh, I could go a lot of directions with this. The business started out of ego. Austin McCullough Advising did. And just to give everybody a, a walkthrough really quick, business started as a coaching business, Austin McCullough Advising, turned into a marketing agency, same name. And then we rebranded it to Lead Goals Accelerator. And then I sold it in early 2023. So, um, and now I'm doing Reply Assist, which I'll get into next, which is a related business, but still very different. So they financial advisors and many people in a sales capacity, they just need more prospects to talk to. They need more conversations because then they have more conversations they have, the more likely they are to get somebody on a meeting, the more likely they are to get somebody on a meeting, the more likely they are to close the new business for a client or if they're in a recruiting capacity of recruit. Hmm. With the coaching, you can work on their mindset as much as possible, but people would rather just have it served up to them. Like This is a funny example, but I get Uber Eats at least once a week even though I have many restaurants within walking distance because having it delivered to my building is a lot easier than walking five minutes to the restaurant, right? And so if you just give people what they want, it's just a much easier sell. There, you're not, you're not, half the sales process when selling something people don't want, it's just perceiving them to buy it. It's not freeing up the funds. It's not getting their partner. Or so whether a husband, wife, whatever the buy-in, it's just getting them to want it. And um, if you don't have to get over that hurdle, it just makes the whole process a lot easier. Um, Devin, is there any particular direction you want me to take that? Otherwise, I can just kind of continue. Forward. No, uh, I said we just I'm just looking to, to share the journey and to, 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 or sit back and to li listen and learn. So, yeah, by all means, go ahead. Sure, sure, sure. Um, it's funny when I did podcasts a few years ago, I used to have this like clear agenda that I would try to cover. But now just as I get more and more into entrepreneurship, I try to reflect back on um would be like the valuable lessons to actually go over what I wish I would have been told a long time. No, we're going to save that one because that one's one of the, that, that's the final question I'd like to, to wrap up with. So I'll, I'll cut you off there, but why don't you maybe fast forward a little bit to where you're at today also with uh, reply assist and kind of uh, where you, uh, where you're, how that got started and, and what it is a little bit. Sure, sure, sure. So to show the real distinction between awesome code advising, which became lead goals accelerator, that's all one versus reply assist is it was a service-based business and I always wanted to get into software, just not the scalability is nice, but because I would rather take out as much the human element as possible, not because we don't need humans part of the process, but if you can get technology to do it more reliably, consistently, and be more available than a human is, hmm. why not try? So um, in the last business, we were getting conversations started for our clients, which is great, but then they still needed to respond to their LinkedIn direct messages they still needed to do follow-ups. They still needed to um, book the calls. They had to figure out what to say, when, all, all these different factors. So the whole, and let me give a one-liner for Replysys. Replysys is a LinkedIn prospecting tool that reduces the majority of the prospecting work for financial advisors because it responds to messages for them, does follow-ups for them, and schedules the meeting for them. And I should have said starts conversations. So rather than them having to do all this time with the prospecting work, it's literally just getting the meeting scheduled. So all they have to do is show up to the meeting. And like you, I could even talk on the follow-ups for a long time too. But it's not is a productivity tool, like a lot of software as a service tools are. It's to literally eliminate their prospecting work because financial advisors Devin I'm sure you know this they they're not really just financial advisors they have two roles financial advisors and salespeople and like you know all about this look at attorneys attorneys don't have to worry a ton about sales at least as far as I know so why should they have to juggle two roles that are completely different why should a financial advisor have to be really good at providing financial guidance and being a an expert on that and a really good salesperson. They're juggling two completely different tasks. So the entire philosophy is just to free up th that time, even if they don't want to work more, so they can go spend more time with family and friends. I can't tell you how much my hands have hurt over the years from so much typing. I mean, I, I, I guess I haven't mentioned this. I've personally sent 33,000 invites on LinkedIn, responded over 12,000 one-on-one conversations, which is way more than just 12,000 conversations. And that led to 700 meetings booked. So I've just spent a lot of time at a computer on a phone messaging. And it's just... It sucks up a lot of life, it, it, like mentally and physically. So 
That's why. Now, with that in mind, and as you're getting that business going in there and, uh, and focusing on that as well, kind of catch us up where things at today, you know, how long has the business been in, you know, how long have you been in business? How is it progressing? Is it, you know, taken off and you have money raining down from the skies and more money than you know what to do with, teetering on the verge of bankruptcy, somewhere in the middle, but walk us through a little bit of, of how are things going? Yep. So uh, we're bootstrapped, uh, took the funds from selling the past business lead goals accelerator, which is really nice just for flexibility. Started in March, 2023. Now it being, it's currently what, the end of October, 2023. We're nailing down the last few bits of um, uh, LinkedIn partnerships. So we expect to have our beta le- beta test launched within the next three or four weeks. And then we'll actually be rolling out the official product a few weeks after that. So the main real sense of urgency is to get the official product launched and monetized uh, before the end of the year. So in December, 2023, before January of 2024. And then in terms of, so obviously no, uh, customers yet, but I should say I have a pretty established LinkedIn network as well as partnership newsletters, as well as Facebook groups that I'm part of. And, um, and we're factoring a lot of that in. So my last concern is the sales and marketing really what the core is. And this is something that I like about SaaS that I'm learning along, along the way. There's a lot more work involved with actually getting to the point of monetization because you have to build the entire product from scratch. But when you build something that people crave, which I saw with the lead generation, when you build something that people want, it's a lot easier to sell. And so we're also factoring in the referrals as well. So really the focus isn't about monetizing. The focus is about making sure that we're able to scale the correct way making sure that we get the right um, support engineers in place for ongoing maintenance to make sure that when bugs pop up, it's taken care of, making sure that our chatbot is saying what it's supposed to be saying. I cannot tell you how much time I put into working with that. It's obviously an AI powered chatbot. I just, I don't like to prioritize the AI because everybody talks about that 24 seven and AI. It's amazing but people don't realize that you have to guide it a lot as well, at least at this current stage. So it's not like you just go plug in AI and it takes care of all of your problems. Um, so does that give you a good summary of where we're Absolutely. at right now? Absolutely. No, that's a great uh, walkthrough. So now as we've kind of reached uh, towards uh, the present day of the journey and uh, kind of seeing where things are at and a little bit of where they're headed, um, great time to transition to the two questions I always like to um, ask at the uh, end of each episode. So we'll jump to those now. Um, so you, the first question I'd like to ask is, along your journey, what was the worst business decision you ever made? What'd you learn from it? The worst business decision I ever made was starting Austin Call Advising because of wanting to push my own agenda. That's not what entrepreneurship is. Um, a lot of people, they want to get into entrepreneurship because they want to make a lot of money. That's bluntly the reason why I got in. And that's not what's going to make you the money. Um, it's... There's an analogy I was going to go, but it's not as clear in my mind, but money is a byproduct of the success. And people think that the money's just going to come because like you want to make money and that that's just not how it works. It's uh, like, if, if money is your focal point that motivates you so you can get back or do whatever, like you, you have to actually find something that people crave and people need, and they're willing to contribute dollars towards, um, rather than just what you think is a good idea and then validate it in the market. Like it, it, it just, I cannot tell you how many times I wanted to quit because I wasn't giving people what they want. Like if I could go back, I like, I I remember for like two years straight, I was just weekly. I just wanted to quit and I should have pivoted earlier, but I was just too stubborn. Um, So just focus time on the front end on the opportunity rather than what you think is, is best. No, I think that uh, that's uh, definitely an easy mistake to make, but a a great one to learn. And I think, you know, it sounds like along the way it was kind of, Activity and adjusting and figuring out where to focus, what to focus on, and what that uh, would look like, and uh, and where you find the enjoyment rather than just trying to, to chase a dollar. And I'm not saying you shouldn't want to make a lot of money and be successful, but you kind of find along the way that you know you have to balance that with what is uh, what is the thing that you'll enjoy, you'll be able to offer value, and be in it for the long term. So I think that's a definitely need to mistake to make, but a, a great one to learn from. Mm-hmm. Second question now that I like to ask is, so now if you're talking to somebody that's uh, just getting into a startup or a small business, what would be the, the one piece of advice you give them? Focus. I think we've all heard the whole thing, like seven streams of income, every millionaire, whoever, whatever. People have a lot of money. They always have seven streams of income, but like, it, I heard something from Alex Ramosi, who he's becoming more well-known and he goes, It's extremely egotistical to think that you could do multiple things as well as somebody who's doing one thing. And that really hit me like a brick. Like all I'm working on is replies just right now. And sometimes I have this conversation with my co-founder and other people. It's like, 
I'm not that bright, right? So I can't go juggle multiple things. Plus trying to juggle multiple things stresses me out. Um, there's just so much power in it from so many different angles and focusing on one thing. And that even comes down to not just like, sure, you only have one business, but then also keep in mind that that focus needs to apply in all areas of your life as well. Like, for example, I was I was working until 2.30 in the morning last night, right? And I'm an established entrepreneur. It's not like I'm just completely new to the ballgame. I have a lot to learn that I'm not saying that with, like, take that with a grain of salt. And so the point is, like, it, it's focused in every single area of your life. Like, you can't go spend... 50 hours per week at the gym. You can't go watch all the uh, fo Sunday football games. You can't watch all the Saturday football games for college. You can't go have happy hour every single night. Like e true balance is a joke. And so you have to have focus on that business for a short period of time. It's not going to take up your entire life, but like you have to have extreme focus where that's just your obsession. Like I love the word obsession. So I know I kind of went on a tangent there, but um, a lot of people don't have focus so they can't get traction. No, I think that's a definitely, and it's, it's one where, you know, it's a balance to be an, or to the typical entrepreneur. You get in it because you have a lot of passions, a lot of uh, interests, a lot of things that you find exciting. And you, you look at something and say, hey, I can do that better, cheaper, faster or improve it or create something that's not out there. And yet you also have to balance that with you have to focus and you can chase after kind of, you know, every squirrel or rabbit or whatever you want to call it. Um, that you know may or, that uh, may be a, of interest, but isn't going to be impactful to business or isn't going to or create that value that you need for it. So, mm -hmm. perfect. Well, now as uh, as we do wrap up uh, the episode, if people want to uh, reach out to you, they want to be a customer, they want to be a client, they want to be an employee, they want to be an investor, they want to be your next best friend, any or all of the above. What's the best way to reach out to you, contact you, find out more? I'm always really easy to find on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, anything. You just look up Austin McCullough. So Austin, last name is M-C-C-U-L-L-O-H. And I wanted to give you props for one thing there, Devin. When I was uh, prepping for the podcast, I was listening to another episode. I like the end of that bit. If you're trying to find another friend, I, I just think it's just a nice touch. That made me laugh. Absolutely. Hey, well, if nothing else, you can. everybody always needs a new, a new best friend. So... Yeah. With that, uh, thank you again for coming on the podcast, Austin. It's been a fun. It's been fun. It's been a pleasure. Now, for all the other listeners that are out there, if you have your own journey to share and you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, we'd love to have you. So let's go to uh, inventiveguest.com. Apply to be on the show. A couple more things as listeners. Uh, make sure to click share, subscribe, leave us a review. Helps us reach even more startups and small businesses to help them along their journey to success. And on that note, if you ever need help along your journey with patents or trademarks or anything else with your startup or your small business, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we are always here to help. Well, thank you again, Austin, for uh, coming on the podcast and wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. Thank you, Devin.